I think there, there's something special about a baptism on Easter Sunday. Amen. You don't forget it when it's on Easter Sunday. Roger's been on that. Roger's been worshiping with us for a long time here, several years, and uh, Jennifer's faithful to bring him, and he walks on sometimes with this. Yeah. So at least it's not going. It is warm. Thank God. When I got to work to church this morning, and Mark said, I'm sorry. She said, you need to go fill the water, see if it's going to be soon. I thought, oh my goodness, it's going to be cold. <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Roger is a, a member here, but did you realize that, that perhaps when he was seven years old, he didn't fully understand what he was doing. And so he called me or texted me on Sunday evening and said, I need to talk to you. And you'll be available tomorrow. I said, sure. So he called me on Monday morning. And he was on his back porch, and I was on my back porch, and we could both hear the birds in each other's background. Friday started off by saying, I don't think God knows my name. I said, well, we can take care of that today. And we talked for, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. I don't know. When he and I get talking, he ends up being a long conversation. But he ended up praying, asked the Lord to come to his heart and, and save her son his wife to him. And I was grateful for that. So we come today to baptize Roger after his profession of faith. Roger, what's your confession of faith? Amen. Upon your confession of faith, I baptize you, my brother. And then the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here is that wisdom. Praise to all the new display.
worship our Lord in our singing this morning. If you're able, would you stand with me again? We're going to sing together, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God.
Corinthians 15, page 934. Now our faith is based on fact. One of you saw the uh, <clears throat> DR Times article yesterday, and it was uh, an op-ed. And the op-ed said that we need to kill God. We need to kill the God of uh, Good Friday. We need to kill the God of Passover because He's the God of hate. And it, it's a, if you haven't read the, the op-ed, you need to go read it. It'll enlighten you about how the world views uh, Christianity and how the world views you as a believer in Lord Jesus Christ. That uh, to the lost world, you're a little more than a piece of garbage. Uh, but in that Christ is little more than a faith. Uh, but go read the article from the New York Times. It will uh, open your eyes to the situation of, of the world around us. But in truth, the, the, the faith that we have is based upon facts. And these facts were arrived at intentionally. It, it's a faith built upon the evidence that ultimately led us uh, to these facts. However, I need to share some uh, discouraging news with you. Uh, perhaps even some shocking news. There has been an archaeological discovery. I don't know if you read the article this week, but, but I did. And the article says this. I, Joseph of Arimathea, took the body of Jesus, the Nazarene, from the tomb where it was first laid and hid it in its place. The press report uh, went on to share that there had been a discovery outside of Jerusalem. If you didn't read the article, I encourage you to go read it. The article says that there now seems no shadow of doubt that the disappearance of the body of Christ from the first tomb is accounted for. And the resurrection as told in the Gospels did not take place. Joseph of Arimathea here confesses that he stole the body away. And as you might imagine... As this news spread out this week, there were many people who welcomed the, the news that the body of Christ had been discovered, that there were actual bones in this place, and Jesus apparently was not the Son of God that he claims to be, that, it, that all this seemed that he was nothing more than a good teacher who taught real truth for the people back then, but that he, he was mistreated by those in authority. But if that were true, you would not be here today. Churches would be empty. In less than a year, society would break down because there would be no standard by which to live. The writer went on to say, archaeologists, do you care to go ahead about three slides? One more, one more, one more, one more. There. Archaeologists have found a newly unearthed tomb in the suburbs of Jerusalem. The remains of an ancient man who quite evidently died in crucifixion was there. On the walls of that tomb, they found also a plaque written in ancient Hebrew that translated reads. Here lies Jesus of Nazareth, the great and good teacher. We secreted his body away in order to place him beyond the reach and rage of his enemies. He was the best of men, and he rest in peace. Shocking news, isn't it? How do we read something like that on Easter Sunday? Well, I'm happy to share with you that's pure fiction. That's right. The man's name was Mr. Thor. He authored the article titled, When It Was Dark. You want to go find it? And he describes a situation in which an atheist decides to destroy Christianity. And honestly, it's a good read. It will push you to the brink of uh, of the edge of your face to realize how important it is that we embrace the fact of an empty tomb. So this uh, writer, he, he, uh, this atheist hires an archaeologist to create this fraudulent find in Israel. And the result of this writing really is catastrophic as the article of the book unfolds and hope goes out like a candle in the wind and joy disappears from the earth. But it's all a lie. It's not true. Now, the article in the New York Times this week is an authentic article. You really need to go read it. The message that comes from the empty tomb is that there's, there's hope. And that there's everlasting hope. There's a certain hope of eternal life uh, from Jesus Christ our Lord. And I invite you to join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, page 934 here in the Bible. Paul writes, he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. 
For the trumpet will sound, <clears throat> the dead will be raised and perishable, <clears throat> and we will be saved. <coughs> for the perishable must clothe itself with, imper with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. <clears throat> death has been swallowed up by victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sin? You know, for centuries, people have stood beside that dark hole in the ground that we call the grave. And they've watched the, the, the remains of their loved ones lowered into that dark hole, and they've wondered. People have wondered, what lies beyond this dark black hole? What lies beyond this grave? What lies beyond the blackness of the pit of death? What's there? Is there anything there? I'm going to tell you, one day there was a young explorer. He went out to discover what might be there beyond that black hole in the ground. And he went into the setting sun. And, and this young explorer descended into the darkness of the pit of death. And he fell to the edge of the world, crashing into hell itself. And people waited, <coughs> expecting. Finally, on this resurrection morning, and I don't know if you have read the articles, but there is a move now that says no one can know for sure when Resurrection Sunday was. You can't even know the year. Folks, that's just not true. It follows the Jewish lunar calendar. Passover is not the same weekend every year because it follows the phases of the moon. But we can travel back in time and know that Resurrection Sunday had the date. Right. It was April the 8th, 30 AD. That year 30 is an important year for us to remember. But one day, on this resurrection morning, as the sun rose, the Son of God stepped from that <laughs> grave, that dark hole, from that pit. And his discovery was there certainly indeed is something beyond this black hole in the ground. That, that there is a paradise waiting for those who believe in him that's beyond our wildest expectations. And there awaits for us a heavenly father. And he's waiting there with outstretched arms to wipe away every tear from your cheek. Yes, there's something beyond that black hole in the earth. But how tragic it would be if this were not the case. See, if there is, if Christ is risen, then nothing else matters. If Christ is not risen, then nothing else matters. If Easter's not true, then your faith, my faith, must fly on broken wings and just be lost forever because it's worthless. There's no more hope in things eternal. Love has lost its strength. Life is nothing more than a ghost. If Easter is alive, alive, then why live at all? Because when you breathe your last, that's it. But my friend, I'm delighted to announce to you today that it is true. No bones have ever been or ever will be discovered. Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, he rose from the dead. And with a mighty stride, he burst through the bonds of death. And today, he's alive forevermore. Amen. Now, there's historical evidence for the resurrection of Christ. You're a part of it today. You're in that institution today. The greatest historical evidence for any fact is that an institution would be built upon that fact. The institution of the United States was built upon the fact of the revolution. We exist today because of the fact of our declaration of independence. Any secular historian will tell you that the Church of Jesus Christ began in the year 30 AD. That is undisputed. The Church of Jesus Christ was born in 30 AD and it's completely undisputed that it was birthed and began in Jerusalem. Now isn't that amazing that the church of Jesus Christ was birthed in the very place 
where the tomb was left in empty. It began in Jerusalem when the followers of Jesus Christ began to proclaim a miraculous event. And that event was that he had risen from the dead. And that event changed history. See, the church is built upon an empty tomb. The greatest institution the world has ever seen. The largest institution that has ever existed on this planet was built on a hole in the ground with nothing in it. There are no bones there. Now you can go to the tomb of Muhammad today. You can go there. And if you go to Muhammad's tomb, they'll tell you, here lies the bones of the great prophet. Because he's still in there. You can travel to the tomb of Napoleon. And when you get to Napoleon's tomb, they'll tell you, here's the great, the bones of the great priest Napoleon, who was the emperor of France. You can go to Moscow. And you can walk right up to Vladimir Lenin's tomb. And they'll tell you, here lies the bones of the man who created Soviet communism. But should you venture to the tomb of Jesus and they'll tell you. You can walk right up to the tomb and see it for yourself and they will tell you here lies the bones of Noah. He's not here. He is risen as he said he would. And the message from the empty tomb is a message of hope. Second, the resurrection is a message of love. I mean, we, we should never forget, though, really, that the tomb was empty. I mean, it was a tomb. It wasn't an empty house. It wasn't an empty palace. It's significant that it was an empty tomb. And that empty tomb speaks a message of love. John Green grew up with a passion for travel. His greatest dream and ambition was to see all the sights and wonders of the world. And, and he kind of mapped out how he might see all the sights and wonders of the world. But that all came crashing to the end with the Great Depression in 1929. As the stock market crashed, so did his dreams. <laughs> and the Great Depression settled in like death across our country. And in many ways around the world. And his dreams were swept away. So he packed up his wife, his baby boy, and all their belongings, and, and they left their town in Oklahoma to look for greener pastures somewhere else. And he drove and drove, and he finally got a job operating a bridge across the Mississippi River. It was 1937, and this is a true story. As he started his job, his son was eight years old for the when he first took him to see what he did when he operated the drawbridge. And so John took his son, his eight-year-old boy, to, to work with him to see all that daddy did. And, and that little eight-year-old boy was excited to see how this bridge would rise and fall at the command of his father. And he was amazed at his father's command over this bridge as ships would come approaching and would go up and as a train would come and the bridge would fall down. Huge boats steamed up and down the Mississippi. Well, 12 o'clock came, it was time for lunch, and, and so the, the father raised the bridge since there were no sh uh, ship schedules for quite some time, and, and he and his son walked out, uh, out as far as they could, a couple hundred feet across the catwalk, out over the river to an observation deck. The father and eight-year-old son sat down that observation deck and began to unwrap their brown lunch bags and eat lunch together and enjoy the afternoon. As they watched the ships go in and out, the father told the son about all the grand places where these ships were coming from, places that he wanted to go. And the places where all these ships were going and, and all the wonderful things that were happening in those far off places. Enjoying their lunch together. Time just whirled by. And out of nowhere, they heard a whistle. Far in the distance. It was the 107, the Memphis Express, that was barreling down the railroad track towards the Mississippi River, and the bridge was up. Dad told his son, 
You went right here. I'm going to run over there, lower the bridge, but you stay right here. So John ran out, climbed up the ladder, got up to the top where, where the, the big lever was that operated the gear that raised and, and lowered the bridge. And, and he looked down the river and saw that, that the coast was clear, no ships were coming. He looked up the river to see that the coast was clear and no ships were coming. And he extended his hand to, to shove that lever, lever forward and he looked down to make sure there were no ships beneath the bridge. But something caught his eye as he looked down. His son had tried to follow him, and he saw it. And there under that bridge was a huge gearbox, a mechanism that operated the bridge as it raised and lowered. And his son had fallen into that gearbox. His left leg was stuck. The father panicked. His throat swelled up. What do I do? I've got to get down there. That's my boy. There are 400 passengers barreling towards the bridge. So he leaped to his feet, began to grab that rope to go down and, and to retrieve his, front, his son from down in that gearbox. But he heard the click clack of the wheel of the train on the track. There was a, a, another whistle sound, and he knew that as sure as the sun came up that morning, that if he pushed that lever, his son would die, but there were 400 passengers coming. His mind whirled. What could he do? What, what could he do? I'm a dad. That's my boy. My only boy. What could he do? 400 people. He knew what he had to do. But John buried his face in his elbow. And he showed it fearful. That bridge began to slowly go down, the whole time crushing his son to save those 400 people. He lifted his tear filled face and watched as the train flashed by. And he could see in the window that there were men reading their papers, there were ladies sipping their tea. There were children eating ice cream. But nobody looked at the control room. Nobody looked at his tears. Nobody, nobody looked down at the gearbox where his son was trapped. In heart-wrenching agony, he beat and banged against the window of the control room. And he said, what's wrong with you people? Don't you care? That's my son. I sacrificed my son for you. Don't you care? Nobody looked. Nobody heard. And the train disappeared across the mighty Mississippi River. That's a true story. There's another true story. God the Father <coughs> cast his son into the gearbox of his justice for you. His son bore in himself the sin of the world. In the great years of God, Christ gave up his life for us, and, and the remains that were left were placed in a tomb outside of Jerusalem. It's a tomb that carries a message of unspeakable love for us. That God should love us so that he gave the Savior's blood. He threw the gear of justice for our mercy. The resurrection is a message of hope. It's a message of love, but it's also a message of grace. It's, it's amazing, astounding, astonishing grace that the creator of the universe, the creator of you, would come and die for the creature's sin. For you. See, the wages of sin are dead. They always are. <clears throat> Always will be. But there at Calvary, where that great gear was put in motion and God crushed his son, and there at that tomb, those wages of your sin and my sin and the sin of the world was paid in full. It was signed, sealed, and delivered. Jesus paid it all. Now all to him we owe. 
how tragic it would be that on this Easter day, see on April the 8th, 30 AD, Jesus walked out of the tomb. Yeah. How tragic it would be that we failed to grasp the meaning. He did all this for, for, for us, all this for, for you, for your family. He, he endured it all in our place that we might have the gift of eternal life. And listen, it's free. It doesn't cost you a thing. It cost him everything. The gift of God, the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, paid for by Jesus Christ our Lord, and offered freely to all those who received them into their hearts. For those who trust in his atoning death as a payment for their sins, eternal life is yours. The Perrys sing a song called, If You Knew Him, one of my favorites. And the words of the song say this, I walked by the tomb of Buddha, looked inside and saw his bones. Traveled to see Muhammad still wrapped up in his grave clothes. Then I journeyed to a garden where old Joseph left him lay. The precious lamb, God's own begotten, was no longer in that grave. If you knew him like I know him, you would know that he's alive. Amen. Have you ever experienced that transformation. One of my favorite verses is Romans 10, 9 and 10. Roger prayed it with me on a Monday morning. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your mouth that you confess and the righteousness with your heart that you believe. Have you ever done that? I mean, the odds are since you're in church on Easter Sunday, you most likely have. But I don't want anybody to be fooled. We gotta know for sure. See, you'll never know life until you really know him. You might know about life. I say it frequently. If you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this life that you're living today is the closest to heaven you'll ever come. You'll never get any closer to heaven than this life. If you know Christ as your Savior, <coughs> This life is the closest to hell you ever get. What I'm saying is, if you know Christ, you'll never experience hell. If you don't know him, you'll never experience heaven. Do you know him? May he come into your heart today to say, Dear Lord, may he roll away that stone that's across your heart. Ask him to come into your empty heart. Does it take courage? Yeah. But it's worth it. Because in exchange you receive eternal life. Ask him to come into your heart and be with his love, with his joy, with his hope. And then you can know that one day, and it's coming, when they lower you down into the dark hole in the ground, that even as they lower your body into the ground, you're already in the mansions above. Paul says to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. You'll never taste death. Open your heart, buddy, for they won't you do that today. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation as Jack will come. <coughs> this is what we call our invitation, our hymn of decision. And it's our time to give you an opportunity to make a spiritual decision. Certainly you can make them in your seat. There's something about that on right here. Now, you don't have to come to me. You can just come and pray on your own if you want to. If you want somebody to pray with you, I'll be glad to. If you've got any spiritual decision to make, this is Easter Sunday. There's no better day than today. Let's sit together. Let's sit together.
The church was born today. We're the church. So what happens next after the garden? The garden of Gethsemane. The garden where Jesus was laid. The garden of Eden. What happens now? That's next time. On your way out, remember to sign up for the ladies' luncheon. Remember to sign up for Wednesday child care. God bless you. Happy Easter. Be sure to give Roger a hug.